Okay, looking over Bonnie's mesh here, we're going to have a look at making this um, snake tail handle. Uh, and I'm going to do it using loft curves as my approach. And there's a few little things we want to take care of uh, on this mesh first. Uh, one of them is that the snake is kind of messed up at the neck where it joins the bottle. So there's some some weird stuff going on. I think what I'm going to do is just delete everything from the neck down and then we'll bridge it to the rest of the bottle. Um, similarly, looking at this, this is obviously like um, Bonnie's design that it comes out on each end like this, but this mesh doesn't seem symmetrical. So in fact, the whole thing doesn't seem symmetrical. Maybe just because you use 20 sides, um, it's going to be tricky to work with 20 sides. What I might do is just make the bottle again um, using a number of sides that divides evenly. Or if you're going to do this kind of extrusion thing, you need to pick uh, two faces at a time, right? So it's, it's even on the central line. This is the uh, 24. Um, nice number. We could also go for 32. 32 seems to work pretty well. Well, let's go 32 by 24 because we don't need so many on the height, especially since we're going to squash it down. Also, just by doing it again, we can be sure that it's exactly on the center of the grid. So I'm going to use this one as reference. Um, and in fact, we can even create an image plane here <clears throat> and grab the reference from my desktop. So I think when subdivided, this looks okay, but it's still kind of pinched. So I think if you're going to make um, adjustments like those, you need to be sure that you're going to use soft select so that you get like an even um, effect on the parts of the mesh that you're moving. Something like that, maybe. Grab the verts. Not those ones. And there's something like that. It's kind of a tricky shape. Well, what you can do is you can make the shape by eye and then um, subdivide it to get the correct correct look. We just want to make sure everything's on the grid. Everything's central. These parts do seem to be on the grid. Let's just make sure. Not quite. Make sure everything's central. So then if you have to do any kind of um, retopology stuff, it should be really easy. So something like that is a start. Obviously there's a bit more to be done. This one.
I'm not sure it's a weird shape, but just make sure that whatever you do stays symmetrical and stays uh, on the grid. So then we have this piece, this 20 sided shape, but it's not symmetrical. Um, you can see that like, it's hard to look at it from the bottom, but three sides are extruded there, two sides are extruded there. We want to make sure that it's uh, stays symmetrical. And then if you want to add asymmetry, um, you can do that later. So I'm just going to make this part again by extruding this piece up. Uh, and we can look in the side view, see how this looks against the reference. Trying to replicate that um, those parts that stuck out that was in the original one. Not quite like that. Whatever, we'll come back to that part. But doing the neck, um, we just want to make sure that we have a 20-sided cylinder uh, because we have 20 sides here. Oh, no, we have 16. Okay, we can work with 16. I'm just going to merge this in case there's any stack converts. And there was, so now we only have 14 edges here. That's fine. We can make a 14-edge cylinder. <clears throat> I'm going to duplicate this one to be the top of the this thing. Just blocking stuff out. So new cylinder, we want 14 sides. And this is going to be what our snake neck transitions into. It's tempting even to delete this. We'll just start from the back of the head. Let's see how it looks. Mesh, combine, edge, edge, grab both loops. We should have 14 edges each. Oops, not fill hole, bridge. Then we're going to add um, the blend mode, the, sorry, the curve type to blend. And start adding divisions in. Pretty sure this part's going to be subdivided anyway. So we can move the edge loops without worrying too much. I'm trying to get this kind of um, bulge at the front and the neck coming back that we see in the reference. In general, sometimes having less edges can give you a better result in subdivision mode because you get a smoother curve between the edges you do have. That makes sense. The snake's not, <laughs> not straight. If I look at it. So I just put my pivot point on the middle. 
that's close enough. It doesn't have to be perfect if you're going for something that's kind of like handmade. Okay, so there is our starting point. This this thing might need refining. You might, I don't know, subdivide it, but then like add some uh, hard edges to get this kind of sharp corner. But that's a good start. In fact, why don't we even mock up the materials just so we can see what's going to be gold and what's going to be um, glass. Don't use uh, any fancy materials for this like standard surface. Just make a basic Lambert with a color. Um, we are going to be doing all our texturing in Substance Painter, obviously. So um, we don't want to be exporting complicated materials since we're not even going to be using them. So that gives us an idea of, of uh, where we're going. Let's have a look at the curve snake tail. So I'm just moving the reference until it's kind of aligned where I want it to be. Uh, and the workflow I'm going to be using here is that we're going to make an edge for the top, an edge for the bottom, and one edge for the middle that comes out wider. And then we're going to loft between them and mirror the, the shape. Um, so this gives us a lot of control because we can loft, make our surface, but loft between curves, it's kind of like revolve, but not um, radial, just, does, just goes between the curves. But then that surface that we've created is still dynamically attached to the curves. So we can tweak the curves and add thickness. Um, say we wanted it thicker here where the person might grab it and thinner at the end, obviously. Um, that kind of thing you can't do just by extruding along a curve. You've, you've got a much more um, destructive workflow when you extrude along a curve. So first thing I'm going to do is go into side view, go to curve tools, create curve tool, CB curve. We're going to be using CV curves for this. I'm not worrying about the number of curve points I use because I'm going to be rebuilding the curves to make sure they have the same number of points anyway. The reason being when we loft, we want to have clean geometry. Um, the, the output polygons it creates are going to be linking between the curve points, basically. However many spans you have, okay, however many distances between CVs you have. It's going to define how many polygons. Uh, depending on the settings you use, obviously you may remember from rev the Revolve tool that we use per span number of isopalms. And per span is per gap between CVs. This is one span, this is one span, etc., etc. So I've made the top curve and the bottom curve. I'm going to do the middle one now. Just trying to follow the middle of the snake body. Perfect. One thing I am going to do is reduce the opacity on this um, image plane because it's super, super bright. <clears throat> so there's my three curves. I've got the attribute editor open so I can see the curves in the curve shape tab. 20 spans on this one, 21 spans on this one, 21 spans on this one. We want the same number of spans on all three curves, and we want the CVs to be evenly spaced. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to select, I'm going to do it one at a time actually, curves, rebuild, hit the options box. We just want to make sure we rebuild it to a value that's higher than the highest number of spans on any of the curves. The reason being that if you rebuild a curve with more spans than it already has, you're not going to change the curvature. You're just going to have more points along that curvature. If you rebuild with less spans, you're probably going to lose some of the some of the curves. And all we're trying to do here is make all the curves have the same number of spans. So we want to make sure that we're picking a value that's higher than any of those curves have. So I'm going to rebuild that one. You should see no change. Same here, but you can see the number of spans goes up. Same here. So there's some very small differences. Um, like I said, we can change, move the curves after we've created the lofted surface. So even though there's a little bit of inconsistency, like I probably would move this bit down and this bit up, we can do that afterwards. What I am going to do is move this curve out. 
and then go to the CV at the end. Move it in. I'm using soft select on my CVs, uh, which is something you can do uh, if you want to have like an, a radius of influence along your CVs. So I'm trying to match the thickness of the snake neck. Obviously, like the tail is going to be as thick as the neck, most likely, for the most part. Okay. I'm leaving this one in the middle and this one in the middle so that we can just mirror the, the whole tail. So loft goes in the order you select the curves. We want to either loft from this one to this one to this one or the other way around. We don't want to start at this one, then this one, then this one, if that makes sense. We want to build a surface that goes to here to here. So I'm going to start at the top, select the bottom one, and then select the last one. Surfaces, loft. Now the loft settings are exactly the same as the revolve settings. So if you look in the quick guides we made for revolve, um, you can just copy the same settings from there. Output geometry needs to be quads. Um, tessellation method needs to be general. And then you're specifying per span number of isoparms. So how many isoparametric curves per span? I believe it's on three right now. We can actually check if we go to our NURBS tessellate. Common? No. Advanced tessellation options. Uh, general. So remember, we chose general method per span number of isoparms. We can change the number on the U and on the V. Yeah. So actually, I think we want a bit more on the V. Maybe only two on the U. We're probably going to subdivide this afterwards anyway. Other than that, I'm not going to change anything. I am going to reverse the surface. Reversing the surface shouldn't affect um, any of the control we have over it. So here you can see we've got half a tail. Very nice. You can uh, hopefully tell where this one's going. It's pretty clear. But what we do want to do is now select our curves and start tweaking um, the thickness, the curvature. For example, like here, there's kind of a dip I don't like. Let's start building that up. Maybe under here, we want a little bit more thickness. Just moving the CVs. Trying to make sure that this curve stays really aligned with the center between the other two curves. So we're getting like a nice realistic um, thickness to the body. And obviously you could spend hours fiddling and tweaking with those, uh, those values, those positions. But I'm going to say that's good enough for us. Uh, we are going to mesh mirror. Mirroring on the world should work because we started this on the, the center of the world. We just got to find whether it's X or Z. In this case, it is Z. Merge border threshold on 0 0.01 should work as this, this curve should be uh, perfectly aligned all the way along. And one cool thing about mirroring this kind of stuff is that the uh, transformations, sorry, the the curve controls still work even after the mirror. So if I now go to control vertex and I move this, you'll notice it works on both sides. Same here. So whilst we can move both sides at once, I don't think there's a need to. Uh, one thing, cool thing I haven't shown you, I think, is uh, if we select all the curves and then we go press F7, 
Multi-component selection allows us to select the CVs of all the curves at once. So if we want to change the position of the entire tail, we can do that like this. And obviously we can soft select everything. So remember when I said that um, lofting is a good way to make like ships or vehicles. This is the same kind of thing. Imagine this was the side of a boat. You need to uh, adjust it. This is going to give you loads of control. Loads and loads of control. Okay, so let's say we're happy with that. Delete history, freeze transformations. Since we deleted the history, it's no longer dependent on the curves anymore. So what I'm going to do is edit mesh merge and it did merge the tail for us. I was going to say we need to weld, we need to make a single vertex at the end of the tail. We can check with subdivision whether our merge actually worked properly and it seems like it did. I just deleted the top and bottom edge. Cool. So if I assign whichever one was my gold material, Lambert 2, you can get an idea for what this technique can do. So this gives us way more control than just extruding along a curve. If we compare our reference and our model, you can see they're really close already. Obviously the trim parts need, need detailing. And I said uh, that she needs to think about how this tail is like mounted to the glass because you can't just really stick matter to glass. Uh, maybe there's going to be like a frame going around or some connection points. But hopefully that was help helpful to you guys. Um, if you have complex kind of semi-organic shapes that need to follow a curve, try using loft. It's much more controllable than just extruding.